نحمده ونسلي على رسوله الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وجعل لي وزير من أخلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم إني أسألك علما نافيا رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا آمين سم آمين <تصفيق> السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سورة النساء ورس 104 And do not weaken in pursuit of the enemy. If you should be suffering, so are they suffering as you are suffering. But you expect from Allah that which they do not expect. And Allah is ever knowing and wise. Verse 105 Inna anzalna ilaykal kitaba bil haqqi لتحكم بين الناس بما أراق الله ولا تقل للخائنين خصيما Indeed, we have revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the book in truth, so you may judge between the people by that which Allah has shown you and do not be for the deceitful an advocate. <coughs> Verse number 106 وَاسْتَغْفِرِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ غَفُورَ الرَّحِيمَ And seek forgiveness of Allah. Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. Verse 107 وَلَا تُجَادِلْ أَنِ الَّذِينَ يَحْتَعْنُونَ أَنفُسَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ مَنْ كَانَ خَوَّانًا أَسِيمًا And do not argue on behalf of those who deceive themselves. Indeed, Allah loves not one who is habitually sinful and a deceiver. From the verse 105 till the verse 113, there is a debate and a discussion regarding Allah. Uh, happening during the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The incidents after which these verses were revealed is that there was a hypocrite who belonged to the tribe of Banu Zafar, and uh, his name was uh, Bashir bin Ubarak, and there are reportings in which he was also known as Tama. Whatever his name was, Bashir bin Ubarik, who belonged to Banu Zafar, he stole certain things. And after stealing these things, to conceal them for some time, he put them in the house of a Jew neighbor as a trust. And then after some time, when he was suspected of stealing the things, then he got afraid that he might be caught and he might be punished. So when he got afraid of the punishment, he put the blame of theft on the Jew, which whom he had entrusted with all these things with. So he blamed the theft on the Jew, trying to get away from the punishment. Because you know, the punishment for stealing is, As in Quran, there is a law which is called as the law of Sarqa. The punishment for a person stealing something is cutting off of the hands. So it, is a very, it was a very strict punishment and he got scared of the punishment and he put the blame on the Jew. Now, when he put the blame on the Jew, the case was then brought for settlement and for the decision of the Jew. to the Prophet because he happened to be the Chief Justice of Medina 
Now, once the hearing was in proceeding, what happened was that all the relatives of Bashir bin Ubarak, the people of um, the tribe, all the people of the tribe of Banu Zafar, they also came over and they started telling lies and they started advocating and pleading and supporting the actual thief because he happened to be their relative. So Prophet Sallallahu got convinced and he was about to give his verdict or his decision for punishment of uh, for the Jew. That before the verdict was announced by the Prophet Sallallahu these verses were revealed. And the actual true story was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then Hearing the truth by the revolution, Prophet Sallallahu then uh, gave verdict of punishment not for the Jew but for the hypocrite of the Muslim tribe. So there is a very big message of the justice by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, before I will, I will read the verses later on. But um, going through this. Uh, the story and the incidents, I would need to talk about the lessons or the message which these verses and this incidents in the life of Prophet Sallallahu is conveying to all of us. The first thing which we learned from this occasion was that there is absolutely no doubt, as Allah says, Qul innama ana bashurum mislukum, that Prophet Sallallahu was a human being. And being a human being, he had thus no knowledge of the unknown or of the future or of the hidden aspects until and unless a, revel a revolution was sent to give him information about the future or about the hidden and unknown facts. So this is all very human. Then this story or this event teaches us another lesson that all the decisions or all the activities which are done in haste they are not they are not approved of they are condemned and they are disliked as prophet has been reported to say that all forms of indecent haste is an act of shaitan believer is neither slow and lazy or nor does he have an indecent haste in his activities and in his manners. Like there is another incidence in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu which has been reported in Bukhari, that he was, Prophet Sallallahu was leading the prayers in a mosque. And while the prayers were being conducted, they heard a loud, a loud noise in the background. The people were running or whatever it was. And after Prophet ﷺ finished his salah, he asked what was the matter and what was the all loud noise about. And he was told that there were certain people, some men who were um, coming, who were walking to the mosque. And when they saw that the salah had started and Prophet ﷺ was leading the prayers, they started running to join in quickly so that they don't miss out. So Prophet ﷺ, when heard the whole event, he said that in future, if you see that people have assembled and the salah, the congregational salah has started, then do what? Walk gracefully and join whatever you can and complete the rest of the prayer afterwards. So for the purposes of even joining the congregational salah, Prophet Sallallahu advised against that indecent haste and the believers to maintain their grace and their graceful mannerism. So another point which we gather from this story is the importance of investigation. The importance of investigation and verifying and checking before deciding or giving any final verdict or before deciding any issue should this should be a matter of choice it should be a matter of choice for the believer not to believe any hearsay because it is strongly condemned 
Another message of the lesson we are gathering here is that to plead, to help, to support or to advocate for any dishonest, this is also condemned. And from here, there is a clear message to all the lawyer community who all the lawyers who fight for the evil, for the wicked, for the sinful clients, they have been given a very clear cut and a straightforward message. Like Allah here says, do not be for the deceitful an advocate. And as we've gone through the verse 107 and Allah says, and do not argue on the behalf of those who deceive themselves. And Allah does not love one who is habitually sinful and deceiver. Hawanan athima. So this is a very clear cut message for the lawyer community of all the times. Like Prophet Salaam said, I am a human like you are. When two parties come to me with an issue, one out of the two is clever and wicked and plausible and that sharper or the cleverer or the wicked out of the two, which is more plausible out of the two parties, convinces me to take a wrong decision. Then this is a piece or a portion of fire they have gathered from me. So this is the importance of the message of this whole event is not to be deceitful, not to be dishonest. A believer should not be, should be just trustworthy. The believer should be reliable, dependable, honest. And to be untrustworthy or to be unreliable or to be dishonest is just what? It is a devious act. And this is a devious mannerism to betray the trust. A believer needs to maintain the trust. And being trustworthy and being honest is mandatory for a believer. As regarding trust, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks in verse 8 of Surah Mu'minun, talking about the manners of the believers. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَأَحْدِهِمْ رَعُونَ Believers are who? Who are careful and they are caring about their trust and about their pledges. That is their pledges and their promises and their pacts and their deals. And Prophet ﷺ has been reported to say that a person who does not keep trust has no faith and a person who does not keep pledge has no belief. So the person who is dishonest and the person who breaks and who is not careful and sensitive about pledges and trusts, then his faith and his belief as a believer is not complete and not perfect person who is not keeping trust or the person who is not keeping pledge, keeping his pledge or is dishonest or he lies is what? Prophet ﷺ has been reported to say in Bukhari and Muslim, Ayatul Munafiku Ruba'a. Ayatul Munafiku Ruba'a. Is a hadasa qadaba. Is a ahada ghadara. Akhlafa. There are four qualities and characteristics and behaviors and man manners of a hypocrite. The first is when he talks, he tells lies. When he makes a pledge, when he makes a promise, he breaks it. And then whenever he is entrusted, he's given a trust, he is, he is not trustworthy. And whenever he fights, he just erupts. He just erupts. He misbehaves. He abuses. He uses bad language. So these are the four qualities of a hypocrite. And in the words reported in Muslim, Prophet ﷺ added, despite the fact that he offers his salah, despite the fact that he fasts, and despite the fact that he performs his hajj, so this is the importance of maintaining the trust and being honest. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's 
manner was that he was reputed and called as what? Al-Sadiq. Al-Sadiq, the truthful. And Al-Amin, the trustworthy. And how important it was, how important trust was in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that going back to the night of migration, what happened? The night of migration when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had been ordered by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to immigrate from Mecca to Medina, the night his house was encircled by the enemy. And they had plan of assassination of the Prophet ﷺ. How stressful the situation was. How stressful. What anxiety and what fear. Fear and anxiety and stress and tension about his life, about his honor. And not only his own, the life and the honor of his four young daughters but despite all the stressful condition he even then happened to remain remember all the things which were entrusted to him by the people of Makkah by the known believers of Makkah he still remembered he remembered and not only remembered he was careful about the trust Trust of the things entrusted to him by whom? By the worshippers, by the idol worshippers, by the known believers, by the polytheists, by the enemies who were forcing to leave, to leave his homeland, by the people who were persecuting and who were oppressing and torturing the Muslims, even to return their trusts to them. He was sensitive, he was careful, and he was bothered. He remembered this is the importance of trust. And you know to whom he handed over all these entrusted things of the people of Makkah? He handed them over to Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who? So this is what we need to be careful and mind, mindful about anything which we have been entrusted with and we have all sorts of variable things which we've been entrusted by like if I I quote a few examples for example a teacher for a teacher the time of the students the dues or the fees paid by the parents of the two of the of the students in return of all these the teacher is supposed to do what? He has to teach the students dutifully, conscientiously, sincerely. This is all what? This is all trust. Similarly, a patient. The life and the health of the patient. The fees the physician is going to charge against the medical advice is all what? It is a trust for the physician. Then the patient, the patient, the body of the patient which the surgeon is going to operate is what? The exorbitant charges for the surgical procedure charged is what? This is all trust. But if the surgeon just sits sipping a cup of coffee in his surgeon room, in his surgical office, and the junior performs the surgery of the patient under the general anesthesia, the patient doesn't know who is operating, then this is being what? This is being extremely dishonest, this is cheating, and this is being untrustworthy. Being untrustworthy, being unreliable is devious. It is not the manner and the conduct of believers. It is the manner of a hypocrite. And then talking about some other trusts, the electricity, the gas supplies, and all the energy resources supplied and provided by the state at our doorsteps. 
all these energy resources which are provided by the state at our doorsteps. This is all what? It is a trust of the state. It is a trust of the state to the citizens. And we need to be trustworthy in the usage, in the paying of the dues and the bills dutifully and honestly. Misuse of all these will be what? This will be defalcation at our level. This will be gross dishonesty at our level. Allahumma tawahir qalbi min al-nifaki wa amali min al-riyai wa lisani min al-qazabi wa aini min al-khayanati inna ka ta'lamu man khayinati al-ayni wa ma tuhfi al-sudur So now I will be going through the verses which is related to the same incidents. I repeat verse number 107 and now you will be reading these in the background of the incidents I have um, just narrated. Verse number 107, Allah says, Do not argue on the behalf of those who deceive themselves. Because you know the people of the tribe were arguing for whom? For, um, for the person who was a thief and happened to be their relative. So do not argue. And this is a message being conveyed to whom? To all the lawyer community as well. On behalf of those who deceive themselves, indeed Allah loves not one who is habitually sinful deceiver. Verse 108, they conceal their evil intentions and deeds from the people, but they cannot conceal them from Allah and he is with them in his knowledge when they spend the night in such as he does not accept of speech and ever is Allah of what they do encompassing. Verse 109, here you are, those who argue on their behalf in this worldly life. But who will argue with Allah for them on the day of resurrection or who will be then be their representative? Verse 110, and whoever does a wrong or wrongs himself but then seeks forgiveness of Allah will find Allah forgiving and merciful. So this is what is being suggested that rather than if, if he had, if that hypocrite had stolen the things and he was just fearing the punishment of this, this world, he should have actually been worried about and feared about the punishments in hereafter and he should have rather blaming the Jew he should have seek forgiveness of Allah verse 111 and whoever commits a sin only earns it against himself and Allah is ever knowing and wise verse 112 and whoever earns an offense or a sin and then blames it on an innocent person has taken upon himself a slander and a manifest sin what isma mubina this is all the debate regarding the behavior that Bashir bin Obarik did and it has been condemned. Verse 113 and if it was not for the favor of Allah upon you and his mercy a group of them would have determined to mislead you but they do not mislead except themselves and they will not harm you at all and Allah has revealed to you the book and wisdom and has taught you that which you did not know and ever has the favor of Allah upon you been great. Verse 114 No good is there. No good is there in much of their private conversations except for those who enjoin charity or that which is right or conciliation between people and whoever does that seeking means to, to the approval of Allah then we are going to give him a great reward. Now Allah is saying la khayra fi qasirin min najwaqum there is no good in what in the private conversations or in the whispering of people <coughs> so in this verse 114 another social evil and 
unethical behavior is being condemned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this unethical behavior is whispering. Whispering is like talking in somebody's ear or talking in a low voice so that the rest of the people in the gathering don't get to hear it. Three times in Quran, thrice in Quran has this activity of whispering or talking low in somebody's ears as a private conversation in a get-together or in a gathering. Thrice in Quran has this been condemned and the believers have been asked to refrain from it. So it is, it is something very important. Why is it all that important? Number one, because it is a bad taste in a gathering in a party of people, two people whispering or two people making a private conversation, it is simply a bad taste. It is unethical. It is, it is uncouth. It is bad manners to do so in a gathering. But the main reason is the repercussions, the after effects are the main reason. And the biggest reason is that when two people start talking as a private conversation in whatever form, like I've mentioned, when two people start having a private conversation or they start whispering, then the third or the fourth person who are, who are there, they feel, what do they feel? What impact would it have on them? They will feel left out. The third person would definitely feel as if he, as if he is the odd man out. And this feeling will hurt him and he will definitely feel that they are closer and they are more intimate and he will feel hurt about this. And not only this, he will feel, he will assume definitely that the two of them in their private conversation are definitely discussing something about him. It is a private conversation which they don't want him to be to hear. So obviously they're talking about him. They are discussing him or making fun of him or planning something grievously wrong against him which they don't want him to know. So what will happen? The repercussion would be misunderstanding. The relationship will spoil and Quran, you know, condemns any activity. Quran and the teachings of Islam, they condemn any activity which will spoil the mutual relationship or be the cause of mutual disagreement or mutual misunderstandings. All those activities and deeds are strongly condemned by Quran. So, it will lead to weakening of the bond and the weakening of the relationship between two Muslims. And the relationship between Muslims is what? As Allah says in Quran, There is absolutely no doubt that all the Muslims are what? They are brothers. So the brotherhood and the mutual love and the fraternity is by the mutual love and the bond grows with the mutual love and the bond is broken because of certain disagreements and, and misunderstandings. So Quran condemns all activities and all manners which are going to weaken the bonds between Muslims. So as like Allah says in Quran that when you make a private conversation between the three of you, the fourth is Allah, and you make a private conversation or you whisper five of you, six is Allah. This is to discourage this mannerism. And here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing private conversation or whispering only for two conditions. The two conditions are the first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man amara bi sadaqatin. Any person who is enjoining on charity. What is this? There are two people who are 
having a private conversation or they are talking in a low voice and they are discussing about the issues of a needy muslim brother and the third person is also might be present around and they are just having a private conversation because they want to help him out monetarily by the by their charity in the path of allah and they are just discussing as a whisper because they don't want him to know and they don't want his entity to be disclosed so that his ego might be hurt and he might feel upset so in secrecy they advise one another to help the third person so this can be as a conversation in privacy and then the second matter which for which this private conversation or whispering has been permitted is a matter of reconciliation between two muslims that there are two people who are like angry with each other and they are annoyed and they are at no talking terms but other two people are trying to make up make them up and patch up and have a conciliation so for this this private conversation of whisper will be allowed how pious a deed reconciliating between two muslims is how pious a deed it is that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been reported to say that he he was in a company of the companions and he asked that should i not inform you of a deed which is better than offering salah and better than fasting should i inform you of a deed which is better than offering prayers and fasting the companions immediately said oh messenger of allah surely do that what did prophet sallallahu alaihi say a deed which is better than salah and fasts prophet sallallahu alaihi said to reconcile between two people who who have a disagreement because this will build faith and creating fight between two people will ruin the faith and will destroy the religion how beautiful subhanallah how beautiful the teachings of quran and the message of islam is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let us remember all let us retain all let us adopt all let us teach all let us preach all allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us stand fastness in all these manners and all these deeds suggested by quran verse 115 ومن يشاكك الرسول and whoever opposes the messenger of allah after guidance has become clear to him and follows other than the way of the believers we will we will give him what he has taken and drive him into hell and evil it is as a destination allahumma ajirna min an-nar Allahumma ajirna min an-nar Allahumma ajirna min an-nar Verse 116 Inna Allah la yaghfiru Indeed Allah does not forgive what association with him finding partners with him polytheism Allah does not forgive association with him but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills and he who associates others with Allah has certainly gone far astray verse 117 they call upon instead of him none but female deities and they actually call upon none but a rebellious shaitan female deities were whom the people of the, the arabs they used to call the angels as the daughters of allah and that is what allah is referring to in this verse verse 118 allah whom allah has cursed 
We know that deeds for which the words of curse of Allah come, they are what? They are major sins. Whom Allah has cursed for he, for he had said, I will surely take from among your servants a specific portion. Who is being cursed here is the shaitan. And now in these few next verses will be a con will be quoted a conversation between Allah and Shaitan. When was this conversation? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Hazrat Adam alayhi salam and then he ordered all the angels to prostrate before him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked all the angels to prostrate and what did all the angels do? They accepted and they obeyed the orders and commandment of Allah and all the angels prostrated before Hazrat Adam alayhi salam and that is why how he came to be the superior being. <coughs> Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Fasajadu illa Iblis. All of them prostrated with the exception of Iblis or Shaitan. Shaitan was whom? He was a jinn. Allah says, Wakana min al jinni fa fasaka an amri rabbi. He was from among the jinn, but he was disobedient and he transgressed from the orders of Allah. He did what? Aba was takbara wa kana min al kafirin. He refused and he refused out of arrogance and he became because of his refusal, because of his disobeying the orders of Allah and because of his transgressing from the commandments of Allah. He was labeled as what? Kana min al kafirin. He was from one of the disbelievers, the disobedience. Now, after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him that what stopped you? What stopped you from prostrating in front of Adam alayhi salam when Allah ordered you to? Remember a person who, who stops, intentionally stops prostrating will be asked on the day of judgment. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum rabbi ja'alli maqima salati wa min suriyati. And then when he was asked, he out of sheer arrogance, out of arrogance in all forms and state, intentionally, he answered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Ana khairum min, khalaktani min narin wa khalaktahu min teen. I am better than him. That why should I prostrate before him? Why should I bow down before him? Because I happen to be better than him. You created me out of fire and you created him out of soil. And he thought that fire was stronger and fire was more powerful. Although that was not, that was not the actual, actual condition. Soil is very constructive and soil is very peaceful and soil is totally harmful and soil needs to cultivation and growth and promotion. But as fire, fire is hot, fire burns, fire destroys. Actually, he was arrogant and he said, Ana khairum min. And then out of, out of arrogance, when he disobeyed Allah and he transgressed from the commandments of Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Fakhruj. He was turned out of Jannah. And he was said, Maz'uma madhura. He was called, he was labeled as the cursed one. And when he was asked to leave Jannah, he was exiled from Jannah at that time. He developed enmity for the humans. He developed enmity for the children, for the offsprings of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, due to whom he thought, due to whom he was exiled from Jannah. And there he stood all aggressively. He stood aggressively and arrogantly in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there he made all this conversation. In enmity, in envy, in hatred for the offsprings of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam and for all the human beings, this was the conversation he did. He said, I will surely take from among your servants a specific portion. A specific portion out of their wealth, out of their riches, out of their timings, out of their houses, out of their transports, out of their facilities, out of their bounties and out of their children. And he does. Believe you me, he does. 
he does because he is wicked he does because he does it because of enmity he does that but foolish are those foolish are those who who when he takes the share they hand him over the share allahumma la taj'alna minhum allahumma la taj'alna minhum wallah may we not be among those who hand over the share of our blessings our bounties our timings our energies our qualities our professions our knowledge our capabilities our potentials our children to this shaitan to this cursed shaitan and he said how will i take the share he said i will mislead them i will mislead them i will arouse in them sinful desires and i will command them so they will slit the ears of cattle and i will command them so they will change the creation of allah and whoever takes shaitan as an ally instead of allah has certainly sustained a clear loss allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all from all these actions and all these activities of shaitan Allah save us from this khusran am mubina from this sustaining of this clear loss a'uzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim rabbi a'uzu bika min hamazati shayatin wa a'uzu bika rabbi an yahzuruni Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us all take us all our selves our offsprings our spouses our our families take us all in your protection keep us all in your protections from the clutches of from the wicked from the wicked behaviors and all these ideas and all these desires which he is going to arouse help us protect us save us verse number 120 shaitan promises them and arouses desires in them but shaitan does not promise them except delusion Allah o kind o merciful Allah save us from the delusions of shaitan save us all from the delusions of shaitan verse 121 Allah says ulaika ma'wahum jahannam wa la yajiduna anha mahisa the refuge of those whom who will be deluded by shaitan who will do as commanded by shaitan who follow the sinful desires of shaitan who will follow the commandments of shaitan and will disobey the commandments of rahman allah says the refuge of those will be hell and they will not find from it any escape rabbana srif anna azaba jahannam inna azabaha qana gharama innaha sa'at mustaqarru wa maqama verse 122 wherever allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the hell in quran he is bound to immediately talk about the jannah so in verse number 122 allah says but the ones who believed believed whom believed allah believed the message of quran believed in the teachings of hadith and sunnah but those who believe is only believing going to be sufficient walazina amanu is that only going to be sufficient believing in allah believing in his angels believing in the day of judgment believing in in the books and the, in the divine scriptures believing in the angels is belief going to be sufficient no what allah says walazina amanu wa amilus salihati sanudkhiluhum jannatin tajri min tahtiha al anhar khalidina fiha abadan waqdallahi haqqan wa man astaqu min allahi qila allah the truthful is promising <coughs> allah the truthful is promising that all those who believe and after believing do the righteous deeds righteous deeds are those which are guided in quran which are the commandments of allah which are the do's and don'ts of allah which are the limits and boundaries of allah and quran and which are what 
which were brought and taught by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So one who believes and does righteous deeds, we will admit them to the gardens of Jannah, beneath which rivers will be flowing, wherein they will abide for ever it is the promise of allah and it is a true promise who is more truthful than allah in this statement rabbibni li indaka baitan fil jannah rabbibni li indaka baitan fil jannah allahumma inni as'alukal jannatul firdaus rabbana innana amanna ربنا إننا آمنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وقنا عذاب النار ربنا إننا آمنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار verse 123 Allah says paradise is not obtained you will not be able to achieve you will not be able to be, you will not be able to enter into jannah by your wishful thinking nor by that of the people of scripture whoever does a wrong will be recompensed for it he will not and he will not find besides allah a protector or a helper verse 124 and whoever does righteous deeds whether male or female while being a believer those will enter the jannah and will not be wronged even as much as the speck of a date seed remember there is no concept of gender dis- uh, de- gender discrimination in the teachings of islam verse 125 allah says and who is better in religion and who is better in religion than the one who submits himself to allah so the best religion is of the person who submits who surrenders to the obedience of allah while being a doer of good and follows the religion of ibrahim alayhi salam inclining towards the truth and allah took ibrahim alayhi salam as an intimate friend wattakhaza allah ibrahim khalila verse 126 and to allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth and ever is allah of all things encompassing verse 127 and they request from you a legal ruling concerning women say allah gives you you a ruling about them and about what has been recited to you in the book concerning the orphan girls to whom you do not give what is decreed for them when has it been uh, when, when has it been recited initially in the starting chapters of surah an-nisa we've gone through this so allah is referring to that which has been recited to you in the book concerning the orphan girls to whom you do not give what is decreed for them and yet you desire to marry them and concerning the oppressed among children and that you maintain for orphans their rights in justice and whatever you do of good indeed allah is ever knowing of it verse 128 and if a woman fears from her husband contempt or evasion there is no sin upon them if they make terms of settlement between them and settlement is better allah says wasul hu khair rather than fighting rather than fighting and prolonging the disagreement and misunderstandings what is better wasul hu khair settlement is better and present in human souls is stinginess and if you do good and fear allah then indeed allah is ever with what you do acquainted so in this verse 128 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is suggesting the solution to a marital 
marital disagreement between the husband and the wife there is a fight there is a quarrel and there is a disagreement and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is suggesting a solution to the whole condition now the situation is what the situation is that the husband is not performing as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying khafat min ba'liha nushuzan so the husband is coming down to the level of nushuz here so the situation is that the husband is not performing his duties properly so this is what is being suggested to the wife is that she should behave with with an open heart she should be broad minded she should be behaving open heartedly to make settlement what is being suggested is that rather than getting stingy for her rights just getting stingy for her rights she is being advised to overlook just ignore to give in to accommodate to compromise for a greater interest of settlement for the case might be that if she fights for her rights if she starts fighting for her rights or she sh- starts shouting when she sees his behavior or she starts raising a hue and cry under the situation then you know what might happen is that it might just trigger the anger of the husband and in a furious state he might just end up in a divorce he might just end up in a divorce and she in the whole process of getting a few rights she might <coughs> <coughs> and she might in the process of getting a few rights of which she was deprived of she might end up being deprived of all her rights because of the divorce so trying to get a few unattended requirements she might just land up with a broken house a shattered family no roof over her and her children's head no ground under their feet no one to support them economically and socially so to prevent this crisis to prevent this scenario she is being suggested to let go to accommodate in the interest of preventing a greater loss for the good of herself and for her children and then she has been she has been reassured also fa inna allah kana bima ta'maluna khabira she is being reassured that allah is all knowing seeing and hearing allah who is all knowing allah who is seeing all the happenings allah who is hearing all what the husband is doing and he is up to <coughs> the husband who is not being faithful or loyal and who is not being fair and just allah who is the merciful and who is kind allah who is just allah will not will no doubt on the day of judgment this allah no doubt will on the day of judgment repay her of her deprived rights of the world and allah azza wa jal will repay the rights of this deprived woman in his mighty capacity allah will repay the rights in his mighty capacity so she needs to put her trust in the sovereign judge of the day of resurrection she should accommodate to lesser rights in this world she should accommodate to lesser rights in this world for a better outcome in the world and better blessings in the world here after and this is how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preventing suggesting a method to prevent 
the breaking up of the house and the issue reaching the point of divorce and is trying to create a condition of settlement between the two. Verse 129, Allah says, And you will never be able to equal in feelings between lives, even if you should strive to do so. So do not incline completely towards one and leave the other hanging. And if you amend your affairs and fear Allah, then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. In this verse 29, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the extent of equality the husband is supposed or expected to do among the wives. We have discussed this topic of uh, equality between the wives in the first chapter of Surah An-Nisa. And we talked there in detail that a Muslim husband was allowed to marry one or two or three or four wives at a time. But then there was a strict condition of equality. Allah said there in the first chapter of Allah has said, Allah ta'adilu fawahidatan. Allah ta'adilu fawahidatan. If you cannot be just, if you cannot be fair and you cannot do equality between them, then you cannot avail of the permission. Then you cannot avail of the option. Then just marry one. I would want to repeat again that marrying more than one wives or keeping more than one wives is not obligatory. It is not an order of Allah in Quran. It is just an option, a permission which has been granted for certain situations. But this option and permission which has been granted for certain situation is strictly conditioned with being fair and being just to the wives. And I would repeat the narration of the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu he said that if a man is put into trial with more than one wife, so this is actually a condition and a state of trial, and he does not do justice between them, then on the day of resurrection, he will be resurrected with half his body. So now, when these were the orders of the Quran about the justice between the wives and these were the words of the prophets mentioning about the punishment of the person who does not do justice. So learning all this, the companions were oversensitive and they were very, very touchy about equality of the wives and they were sensitive and they were touchy to the extent that they were getting upset about it. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a practical concept of equality. The concept of equality between the wives is the person or the husband is supposed to do in totally all forms of worldly manners, in all worldly issues, monetary issues, social dealings, the time which he gives to a wife, the turns, the standard of living, the house, the expenditure, the standard of dressing, feeding, schooling, entertainments of the families, they should be they should be the same completely, and that is being fair with the wives and their families. But as far as the feelings and the emotions are concerned, the husband, even if he desires, he cannot be equal in that. Regarding his feelings and his emotions, even if he desires to be fair, he cannot be equal in that. For this, he is being given an option and an exception. Like if I make you understand, if one of the wife is very well mannered and she is polite and she is kind and she is courteous and grateful and soft hearted and obedient to the husband and the other wife is none of the two, none of all these. 
She is ill-mannered. She is disobedient. She is ungrateful. Now what would happen? The husband can't. But just the husband just can't. But help having emotional inclination in his love and his likeliness towards the first. He wouldn't just be able to help it. But he would have an emotional inclination towards the first wife. He would love her more. He would like her more. And he will just not be able to help himself. So that is what is being said that you won't be able to but help your emotions. So far, so for that, you have an excuse and you have an exemption that you will not be held accountable for your emotional inclinations for one as compared to the other. But here again, same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that in this case also, when you have an emotional inclination towards the one, the husband is practically has been very strictly instructed that the husband should not practically leave the wife he is not emotionally inclined towards suspended, neglected or ignored in the worldly issues or matters despite his being less attached to her or less fond of her he is still supposed to deal equally regarding all the rest of the issues and that is what Allah is saying that do not incline completely towards the one towards the one you are emotionally inclined to you love her more you are fond of her and do not leave the other hanging so this is the practical option and the solution which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given in these state of affairs. Now verse 130, Allah says, But if they separate by divorce, Allah will enrich each of them from his abundance. And ever is Allah encompassing and wise. So Wasian Hakima Rab and sustainer here is talking about a situation of divorce. That if they separate by divorce, then Allah will enrich for them his abundance. What is this all about? Now, if I repeat what we discussed in the previous chapters of Surah An Nisa. In the initial chapters of Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in detail discussed about all the marital affairs. Like the rights and the duties of the husband and the wife have been clearly announced. So that they can both realize, they can both comprehend and being dutiful to their rights, to the duties which are obviously the rights of the spouse being dutiful, they will be able to weave one of the best loving bonds among themselves and they can have a very successful marital relationship. Then other than the rights and duties of the husband and wife, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, has instructed us the case when the wife sticks to no shoes and the wife prefers and is obstinately and is with full disobedience is sticking against the husband then what is he supposed to do the three steps were fa'izuhunna wahjuruhunna wadribuhunna and we have talked about that and now here in the previous verse we've discussed that if the husband turns out to be acting like no shoes, then how does the wife relate with that? And then also we discussed in the initial verses and the chapters that Allah said that if there is a disagreement between the two and the fight is just not settling down and the issue is just not finishing up, then we need to fix up or appoint two arbitrators from the families of both the husband and the wife and for the desire of making reconciliation between them. Allah says in Arada Islahan, if they both desire reconciliation, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a, a, a method for the reconciliation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, despite explaining all this, now here is explaining and is consoling 
and is reassuring about a condition where the fights and the disagreements and the misunderstandings between the hun husband and the wife continue to an extent that divorce becomes inevitable. Divorce becomes inevitable. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is consoling about that situation. Although divorce is extremely disliked and hated in the sight of Allah. But despite that, in such a condition, if such a condition is prevailing, that both the husband and the wife, they cannot just get along. They just cannot get along. And if they are forcibly made to get along, serious repercussions may turn out or there may be a disaster. They might end up in a disaster, like one murdering the other, one poisoning the other. We do hear of all these stories happening in the society, don't we? So if they just can't get along and if they're forced to stand and forced to get along by their family or by their parents or by their relatives, then there might be a huge disaster or a calamity. So in such a situation, they're splitting away, they're separating away and they're going ahead with the divorce is not being stopped. And in such a condition, this couple who is going ahead with the decision of divorce is being consoled. Why do they need to be consoled is because at this time, when they are thinking and deciding of this indispensable and unavoidable divorce, they sometimes they have their reservations and they got, get upset. Like they get upset. What will happen about the children? The husband might just be worried about who will cook for them, who will feed them, who will wash for them, who will run my house. The wife might be just worried and concerned who will support me economically and will I be able to live without my children? How will the system run? So there will be thoughts coming in their minds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is reassuring this couple for whom the divorce has become unavoidable. It is an unavoidable situation. So that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reassuring them that despite that you've been dependent on each other, but even if you separate, Allah, Allah will make you independent of each other. It was Allah, it was Allah the sustainer, the merciful, who was running the system even before and he will still evolve a system even afterwards and he will enrich for both of you in his abundance. So the provider of all provisions, the sustainer, the merciful and kind Allah is reassuring the couple and in this situation is making it possible for them to move ahead in life because life doesn't come to still with certain situations. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ خديتنا وحب لنا ملة كرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستقبلك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين